Hey everybody, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our weekly lecture. Uh, today's lecture is on the Queen's Gambit Declined. And a little different than usual, and I want to thank Alec Quinn, who is our sponsor this week. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact my wife Karen, karen at atlchessclub.com, and uh, we'll have your sponsored lecture. Now, today's lecture is slightly different than other ones because all of my life, when I've lectured on openings, uh, if it's a queen's pawn opening, which this is, then like 90% of the time or more, it's from white's point of view, or it's from nobody's point of view. I'm just trying to discuss the opening. But today we're gonna look at it from black's point of view because we think that's what the sponsor wanted, but we're not 100% sure. So if he didn't want that, this is actually funny. So I'm sure he has a great sense of humor. Um, and I've talked a lot about the Queen's Gambit and other openings for white in the queen pawn genre, because I just did a chessable course uh, that came out about three or four months ago on white playing d4, starting out with one d4. So a lot of what I'm gonna discuss today uh, is, is in the, is, some of it's in the course, but I wanted to discuss different ways for white to play against the queen's gambit declined, and we could see how black can deal with each one of those. Now it's a 45 minute lecture, so I can't talk about everything, but I'll talk about as much as I can. The Wikipedia article actually reminded me of something that I probably wouldn't have mentioned if I didn't read the article, which is the Queen's Gambit declined, like a lot of openings, but especially the Queen's Gambit declined, can get to the same positions on move four, five, six, seven by transposition. It doesn't have to be the same move order. And in fact, when I started playing chess as a kid, uh, I played the Queen's Gambit declined with black before I played it with white. And probably the reason was because of the Korshnoi Karpov games from their matches from 1978 and 1981, um, where you see a lot of Queen's Gambits. And <clears throat> this transposition reminded me of that time in my life because those games typically didn't start with the move order given in Wikipedia, d4, d5, c4, e6, which I think is gonna be every game we look at today. Those games actually started with white playing c4 on move one and trying to play an English opening and Karpov would play e6 and d5 and they would get to the same position eventually. Um, so the problem with the queen's gambit declined <clears throat> from black's point of view is it blocks in his queen bishop, which you can see in this tiny diagram on Wikipedia the bishops blocked in. What's good about the queen's gambit declined compared to some other variations of the queen's pawn is black can try to play c5 immediately uh, between moves three and 10 and attack white center. And they talk about other queen pawn openings in the queen's gambit declined uh, Wikipedia article. So you can see what other openings are called that are sort of similar. Um, and they talk about black playing unusually and not playing the Queen's Gambit decline main lines and transposing or playing other variations. Uh, okay, and then they talk about the, the Tartar Cower, the Lasker variation, the classical, the Cambridge Springs, the exchange variation, all kinds of different variations of the Queen's Gambit. So obviously we can't talk about all of it, but we're gonna talk about a lot of it. And difference between the Queen's Gambit declined and the Queen's Gambit accepted is we're not taking the pawn on, on, on C4, we're declining. Okay, and we, we, have, we have a chat. The Agincourt defense, what? Okay, um, yeah, that is something, as long as I don't have to play it. Okay, let's get to the, the actual games. Okay, and we're gonna look at it from Black's point of view, uh, and then I have to get rid of the notation. Okay, good. Okay, this is from the US Championship in 2016. Lenderman was white. He's played in many US Championships, Alex Lenderman. He's won the US Open more than once. He's played in like 10 US Championships. His USCF rating has been over 2,700. His FIDE rating is usually over 2,600. And he's playing white against Fabiano Caruana, who needs no introduction. I don't even know why I said his name. It was obvious who it was at the beginning. Okay. and. As I said earlier, 
you, you can transpose it into the Queen's Gambit from different openings. And when I was playing the Queen's Gambit with Black when I was a kid, the games that I mostly knew were the Korshnoi Karpov games from their matches, which started C4, E6, Knight C3, D5, D4, which gives us typical starting position, but from a different move order. And other move orders that were given were like D4, Knight F6, C4, E6, Knight C3, and then D5. And we have a Queen's Gambit declined. It's just that, you know, it wasn't really a Queen's Gambit to start with because white didn't sacrifice a pawn, but we transposed with the, playing the moves in a different order. And the Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, these positions you can get, again, in the early middle game between moves, let's say, 6 and 11. Uh, those positions can come from different move orders. Sometimes white even starts with knight f3, and then we'll transpose into a queen's gambit declined, because they just play the same moves, just in a different order. So this game, Lenderman played c4, which I should have known since was the last one, and then Fabi played e6, and then they transposed, just like I was showing from the Korshnoi Karpov games, except this is the game. This is Lenderman Karawana. And Fabi, with black, plays a lot of different stuff against c4. This is actually a little bit unusual for him to play a queen's gambit declined. I think he wanted to take Lenderman out of his prep facing what Fabiano usually does. Okay, bishop e7. Now, bishop e7 was popularized by the world champion Tigran Petrosian. Not the guy now Tigran Petrosian, the world champion Tigran Petrosian. He died around 1985. So he's not the one we're talking about now. And he popularized this bishop e7 move uh, to stop certain variations that white can play where he's not playing knight f3. So for example, if black plays knight f6, which is perfectly fine, if white wants to, he can play variations where instead of playing knight f3, he's playing bishop d3 and knight e2. Typically in the exchange variation, Bishop d3, let's say c6, knight e2. Okay, and this is a different way for white to play than for white to play knight f3. Also, there's some lines, and we're actually going to look at a Kramnik game in this line after knight f6, where white plays an early queen f3, which we're actually going to see in a couple games. So bishop e7 is considered like a little more precise if you're gonna play the regular variations of the Queen's Gambit declined. Unfortunately, this gives white another option, which some people care about, and Fabiano obviously doesn't. And I would say most people with black aren't afraid of this. So, and this is lines where white doesn't play knight f3 here. Bishop g5 is not to be recommended. Don't, don't do that. And we play the move c, d, e, d, bishop f4. And what we're doing is we're saying, you played bishop e7 really early, so if you want to play bishop d6 and trade bishops, which some people do play between moves like 6 and 10, you're going to lose a tempo. You've already played bishop e7. And probably more importantly than that, since, you didn't, since you've already played bishop e7, I'm less worried about bishop f4. And frankly, if black had played knight f6 instead of bishop e7, I think bishop b4 and c5 and queen a5, I think this is a good line for black to play aggressively. Of course, if black's already played bishop e7, I'm not afraid to play bishop b4 because he's losing a tempo. Okay, now in this line, black plays the move c6 because black wants to move his bishop out. One of the advantages for black in the exchange variation is the bishop isn't blocked in by the e6 pawn. However, we can't get all willy-nilly. Let's see, I heard a noise there. And that was a great noise. I don't, I don't see what people want, but it was still a great noise. Okay, so if you, you want to move your bishop out from c8 because you can, because the pawn's not on e6. However, if we do it too quickly without more thought, then we have problems on d5 and b7. And in Queen's Gambit's declines, and in almost all Queen's Pawn's openings, these are some of Black's issues. His pawn on b7, his pawn on d5. So Fabi plays the move c6, 
This defends the d5 pawn, gives black a solid pawn structure, and some players don't want black to play bishop f5, so they're going to play an early queen c2 as early as possible just to stop black from playing bishop f5. Okay, and white played e3, and after bishop f5, if black is able to develop normally and just play knight d7, knight f6 castles, black has nothing to worry about. There's no reason to think that black is worse. And so what white typically does against bishop f5 is he plays super aggressively, and we'll, we'll see in the game. Now, if black plays like more boring, just like, well, I'll play knight f6 in castle, now white can play bishop d3, and black doesn't have the option to play bishop f5 anymore. So if black wants to play bishop f5, th this is his chance. Okay, And white tries to punish it by playing super aggressively on the king side with the move g4. And the idea is, if the bishop goes back to g6, we'll play h4, and we'll keep attacking the bishop. Bishop e6 is more common because we don't want to get our bishop trapped on g6 after something like h4, h5. What's funny is bishop e6 isn't stopping white from playing h4, uh, so white often plays super aggressive anyway on the, ki on the king's side. And Lenderman did play h4. And of course, we can take this pawn on h4, which some people do, and then you have to deal with the move queen b3. And you're like, what does queen b3 have to do with bishop h4? Typically after queen b3, we have several queen moves that defend our b pawn. Queen b6, queen c8, queen d7. But now we don't have any of those moves because our bishop needs to be defended. So our queen can't come help out. And we don't want to lose our b pawn. We don't really want to play bishop c8. We don't want to play b6 either. It's very weakening. So this is considered an interesting pawn sacrifice for white because white gets the h file. Okay, so f of course the players know this. They're just playing their theoretical preparation. Fabi played knight to d7, developing a piece. That's crazy developing a piece. Who would have thunk it? Okay, and then uh, Lenderman played the move g5. Excuse me. Yeah. I heard a noise, but I don't see anybody. Oh. Uh... Oh, here it is. My bad. I did hear a noise, but I didn't see anybody. It was all my fault. Hey, Isaac, don't forget to mute yourself and to mute me, too. Makes the lecture more interesting when I'm muted. Okay, so white just played the move g5, and white has a lot of space on the king's side. Black has trouble developing his knight. And unfortunately for Lenderman, this is the kind of game that Fabi wants. In the U.S. Championship, there's typically two levels of players, typically. There's players who are good, like, you know, top players in the country. Then there's players who are top players in the world, like Nakamura and Caruana and Wesley So and Dominguez. And they're typically expected to do better than, you know, Ray Robson and Lenderman and Akobian and people who are good in the U.S., but not considered top 10, top 20 in the world. And so in some U.S. championship games, when those world-class players have black, they don't really find any winning chances. And the Queen's Gambit declined is actually a good opening for black to get winning chances because we see an asymmetrical pawn structure where white's trying to get more space on the king's side in this variation, and that can lead to something good for white, or it can lead to disaster since white's not developing his pieces. He's just pushing his king side pawns. And obviously, when you're teaching chess and you're showing these games for, to kids, you know, it's hard to show them g4, h4, g5 and say this is the right way to play and don't let them develop their pieces. So if you want to teach kids to develop their pieces in castle, this is a good game to show them since Fabi was successful. Okay, so... so Caruana played h6, attacking g5 immediately, and Lenderman played g6, which is a pawn sacrifice, and this is still in their preparation. This, is the, this has already been played before. And in this position, 
Fabiano played a move that's never been played before. This was his novelty that he prepared with his team. And I think typically people were taking on g6 and black's king side is sort of messed up. His g6 pawn is weak. White has compensation for a pawn. And instead, Fabi played the move f5. And no matter how much you want to, you can't take that on passant. Okay, and actually, one of the biggest, I don't want to say scandals, it wasn't a scandal, but one of the biggest um, discussions in the history of the U.S. Chess Federation had to do with an illegal on passant capture in, a, in the high school championship in the last round with the top players. They were both like 22, 2300, and there was an illegal on passant capture, which led to a resignation. Then the resignation was rescinded, and then, the move, and then there was a touch move issue with the on passant. And I don't know what happened, but whatever did happen, I don't think it should have happened. Um, and that was about 25 years ago. But that was a funny story because I wasn't involved in it. But it just shows you. And the reason I, I, I bring it up is I think this was the on passant. I think there was a pawn on the sixth and the guy moved his pawn to the fifth and he took it on passant, which, what? Okay, these players are master players. Okay, so Lenderman playing in the U.S. Championship didn't make an illegal move, but it would have been funny if he did. Okay, he played the move bishop g3, which the commentator said was a mistake. And the reason to play bishop g3 is the knight wants to go to f4. And when I say the knight wants to go to f4, he did put his knight on f4 because he wanted to protect his g-pawn, gain a tempo on the bishop, and f -square, f4 is a good square for the knight. So knight f6, knight h3, knight b6, since the bishop's going to get attacked, and it did, knight f4, and his bishop went back to d7. And Fabi, by declining the pawn sacrifice, actually keeps the king side closed. The h-files and the g-files are closed, so Fabi can safely castle king side, and then he can try to use the e4 square for his knight. Now, having said that, Lenderman must have heard me in the past, and he played the move f3. Never play f3, but it stops Caruana from playing knight e4 later. Okay, castles, and then he played king f2. Since the king is safe on the king side, um, I probably would have tried to castle, but maybe he wanted to keep his h-pawn defended against this battery later, so he wanted to have two pieces defending it. Okay, now in this position, if black wants to do something, there's basically only one thing to do. Moving the h-pawn does nothing. You can't move the g-pawn. You can't move the f-pawn. You can't move the d-pawn. Moving the a-pawn doesn't do very much. So Fabi played rook c8 to play the move c5. Bishop d3, and then he played c5. And he waited for... Lenderman to develop his bishop to d3 because that blocked the queen from putting pressure on d5 once these pawns get traded. And white's in a tough spot here because if white trades on c5, he makes the black bishop good. He weakens his own king. If he doesn't trade, he has to watch out for c takes and c4 and black is getting counterplay. So this kind of unusual position could be won by either side. Typically, you would say the better player would win. Um, Black is doing fine out of the opening, and this is exactly what Fabiano Caruana wants. He wants a position that's not boring, where his opponent can easily make a draw. And this is one of the issues the top two or three players in the U.S. Championship have every year, is they're playing lower-rated players. If those players want to draw with white, it's hard to stop them. Okay, so Fabi must have been pretty happy here, knowing that if he did lose or draw... It's because his opponent outplayed him, which being the fact that he's been top five in the world the last 10 years, he's probably not expecting. Okay. And I don't want to talk about the, end, the middle game and end game too much because this is an opening lecture, but this is sort of an unusual, <clears throat> strange position with a weird pawn structure that I think if you're playing for a win with black, you should be very happy. Okay. And... We'll quickly look at the rest of the game and talk about any mistakes that were made. Black played king h8, getting off of this diagonal where the, the queen is harassing. Bishop b5. He wants to trade bishops, so his knight can go into e6. Bishop takes knight. I guess his knight's not going to e6. 
knight h5, attacking the bishop. Bishop goes to e5, <clears throat> takes, takes, knight c4. So black's knights are pretty good. The knights are going to c4 and f4 and e5. And white's king has a lot of space in front of it. White's king, his pawns aren't really shielding his king. Black's king is very shielded. Okay, now if white could cheat, because you should, you know, cheating is a gift man gives himself, the queen could go to h6 and give checkmate soon. So that, that would be an interesting threat. If the white queen could get to that diagonal, black would easily stop it with king g8 or knight f6. But since that's not happening, he doesn't have to worry about that. Now, what white has to worry about is black is going to take this bishop and then play knight f4 check, winning the g6 pawn and exposing the white king more. And that's basically what happened. Okay, and after queen f6, his g pawn is getting rounded up. Now queen g3 check is coming, so he stopped it. Now queen takes h4 check is coming, he stopped it. And, okay, white's down a pawn, and white's king is obviously less safe. White played king e3, which is funny to me. Knight g6, the rook is almost trapped. Knight takes h4, black is still up a pawn. White's king is still terrible. White, black's up two pawns. And in this position, uh, rook c7, rook b8, queen c6. There was a really nice tactic by Fabi. After rook d8, threatening rook takes d4 check, knight takes d4 check, and knight e5 check. Knight e5 check is my favorite tactic, but only if I have black. Notice the d-pawn is pinned and we're forking the king and queen. So Lenderman played king c4, getting out of the pin, which is funny. Rook takes d4 check, and the idea is if you play rook takes d4, I play knight e5 check winning your queen. So he played king c5. It's funny to play king c5 and not resign when you're playing Caruana. You know, if you're playing like a 1200, maybe Lenderman could trick him. But, you know, Caruana has three connected pass pawns and Lenderman's king is running up the board. Some people would resign. Some people. And again, for those of you who were, didn't catch that, Rook takes knight e5 check, wins the queen. And then some. So king c5, which is funnier than not resigning. Rook takes, knight takes, queen check, winning the knight on d1. King c4, queen d4, checkmate. Obviously, he was expecting queen takes knight, and he tried to give some perpetual check, which doesn't exist. But if he plays, if he plays king to the d file, like d6 or d5, then I can play queen takes knight check. Here, queen takes knight isn't check, but queen d4 is mate. And people like when you play until mate. They enjoy that. If you're watching, if you're following the U.S. Championship, especially those of you in the live audience, those of you who are watching on the internet, the U.S. Championship may have ended already. So you're like, what are you talking about? But in the U.S. Championship, uh, there was a game played where uh, White did allow Black to checkmate him. So it, they, instead of resigning, I think it was Sevian. Who did he let checkmate him? Somebody. It might have, it might have been Hans. Hmm. I want to say it was Neiman checkmated Sevian. But, you know, I could be wrong. It could be I made all those names up. Okay. So that's, that's one game. That's one variation. I wanted to show different variations that black can play in this opening. This is Ivan Isevich versus Kramnik. Okay. Now, Ivan Isevich not only is a famous tennis player, but he's a famous chess player. Well, you've never heard of the tennis player because he retired like 20 years ago, but this is a different person, obviously. And I played Ivan Isevich, the chess player, in the Chicago Open about 10 years ago, and I forgot what happened. I, I just don't remember. Okay, He didn't completely crush me. That's, that's not what happened. My therapist said I should talk about this more. Okay, but anyway, I played Ivan Isevich once and it wasn't pretty. Okay, so Kramnik has black. We see the more standard move order here. And Kramnik plays knight f6, and we're, get, we're gonna get to that ending I was telling you about. Takes, takes, bishop g5, and uh, c6, e3. And now, if black wants to play bishop f5, this is his chance. If he doesn't play bishop f5, white plays bishop to d3, develops his pieces normally, and the bishop doesn't get to f5. 
If black plays bishop f5 and white doesn't do anything, black just develops and he's at least equal. And this is one of the main lines of the queen's gambit declined. And I've never had this position with white because I don't play c takes d5 when, I'm, when, when I have the white pieces. When I played this with black 35 years ago, I didn't play bishop f5. So I don't have any experience myself. And white plays the move queen f3. This is one of the advantages of avoiding knight f3 early is now you can mess up black's pawns. Black plays bishop g6 and we take. And with the pawns messed up on the king's side, black doesn't want to have the, the queens on the board because his king will be exposed. So he goes into the end game. And this ending has been analyzed for like 50 years. They come up with new moves all the time. Sometimes the new moves are on move 20 and there's new ideas and they argue whether this is equal or white's better. Now, I guess if you're a lower ranked player, you say like, well, these are no good, so white's better. Also, I'm a higher ranked player and I agree. So I would take white here. However, black has the two bishops and black gets to develop and put his king wherever he wants because white doesn't have any attack. There's no, there's no attack against the black king. Black could castle queen side, black could castle king side, black can play king e7. His king's perfectly safe and he can just develop his pieces and control the center just like white. He says, I have the two bishops and if the knight ever takes my bishop, that straightens out black's pawns. If he doesn't take the bishop, my bishop's pretty nice on g6. Okay, so this ending, we see a lot of draws, but sometimes when there's a mismatch, somebody's 200, 300 points higher than their opponent, then they can win by outplaying them, which is what Kramnik did. Kramnik has the black pieces. Okay, and very solid play. Nobody's doing very much. Kramnik decides to move his knight to d6 because the knight on d6 controls all the squares. And he does. He's waiting for the guy to take on g6. If even Isovich takes on g6, Kramnik can recapture either way and have a much better pawn structure. Okay, b3, stopping knight c4 check. He castled long. And it's very difficult for either side to do anything here. If you said, what's white's plan? What's black's plan? I mean, white's not going to take on g6 and straighten out black's pawns. Black's not going to take on d3 and leave his pawns like that. So both sides are going to maneuver around a lot. And it could be a draw because nobody can do anything. That's a common result. Or somebody could win because they're much stronger than their opponent. Even Yusevich, you probably haven't heard of him. It's like 26, 30 feet, eh? Kramnik, you've heard of him, okay? And there's a reason why you've heard of one player, not the other. One guy's the world champion and played all the best players in the world, beat Kasparov in a match. And the other guy, you don't know, he beat me in the Chicago Open. You're like, who's that guy? Okay, so he played F3, which sort of gives the result of the game away. Never play F3, indicating he might want to play E4 later um, or just stop Black from getting his knight to E4. Rook e8, rook c1, king moves off the rook. And I was very interested looking at this game earlier because I know that black won, how black is going to win. Like what's black's winning plan? And Kramnik was in no hurry. Okay, Kramnik moved around and around and around. And when his, and when his opponent's time got low and his opponent fell asleep, he turned the dial and he won on time. No, that's not what he did. We can't do that anymore. There's, there's only electronic clocks now. Okay, he played knight c8. His knight went to d6. Now he's leaving. Knight f4. Bishop b4 check. Knight went back to d6. So all he did was jump over his knight with his bishop. g4. Rook e7. He's going to double rooks against the weak e pawn. a4. Rook e8. Knight g2. White says, you can't do anything. I can't do anything. Maybe a draw is a good result. Okay, it's a good result for even Isovich. He's probably never drawn somebody like Kramnik before. Kramnik plays knight back to c8. He's not in a hurry. Bishop d6. He attacks his weak f pawn. And he, he allows this trade. Now both sides have a bad pawn structure, but probably White thought that Black's was worse. h6. King f2, 
bishop b4. And now black has a very simple plan, which Kramnik does because uh, of, of the trade for the knight that was on uh, f4. The knight on f4 and the other knight, which could go to f4 later, if that knight disappears, is putting pressure on d5. Now that there's less pressure on d5, black can try to attack the center the same way that Fabi did. And the queen's gambit declined. This is a very common idea for black to play the move c5 at some point. Sometimes you play it on move three, and sometimes you play it on move 33. But you're attacking the center in either case. Okay, so Kramnik moved around again, played f5, securing the e4 square. White's never going to play e4. White played f4, which is a move I don't like, giving away the... So what he's doing is he's giving away the e4 square, and he's trying to get the e5 square for his knight. But I don't like the move f4. Knight e4 check. C takes... Uh, f takes e4. And probably White thought, I'll just sit here and the game's a draw. Black doesn't have any winning plan. But Black's winning plan with c5, and then bust open the center, works just perfectly here. Rook e6. Rook f6. Stopping knight f5. Plays b6. He wants to play c5. And he does. Now if it's Black's move, he can take on d4. You take on d4 and your f4 pawn's hanging. So White played rook d1, so he could take with the rook in case of c takes d4. Rook d8, a5 trading off his isolated a pawn. Rook a2, and Kramnik says, I'm going to open up the center, and I'm going to bust open attacking this, attacking this, and the e pawn is overworked. Again, black has the same threat as before, taking on d4, e takes d4, rook takes f4. So he took on c5, which I think he's forced to do. Now, obviously, black has a better pawn structure. Here comes the center pawns. White tried to get counterplay on the queen's side by attacking black's king. Kramnik didn't care. Kramnik said, give me that pass d pawn. Rook d6. And he played rook d6 so his king could hide on d5. That's a very good hiding square. So rook check. He's running to d5. Rook e7, attacking the pawn on e4. If king to d5, rook e5 check. So you can't do that. So rook e6, king b5, the king's safe on b5. And now we can start getting our pass pawn going. Rook a6, taking the a file. Rook check, d2. And here white resigned. But that knight's been terrible for a long time. Black's next move is going to be rook a1. So I'm telling you my winning plan is rook a1, and your job is to stop it. Well, even Isevich is better than us, so he resigned. He stopped it. Otherwise, rook a1 and black's d-pawn is going to queen. If you play king f2, hoping for rook here, takes, takes, king e2, you got to hope for something. The problem with king f2 is I queen with double discovered triple check. So you can't play king f2. So after d2, there's no stopping rook a1. If you don't like rook a1, I don't know why you wouldn't. You could play rook c2 to c1, also winning. And even Isevich resigned here with white. So that was a very slow, boring sort of end game that got really exciting all of a sudden because black just outplayed white. White was probably playing for a draw. And as you all know, playing for a draw is playing for a loss. Okay, just because your opponent's higher rated than you, you got to play aggressively and try to beat them. If you play passively and try to make a draw, inev invariably, this is what happens. You get outplayed and you lose. Okay, next game is Timofeyev versus Dominguez. Dominguez is one of the American players playing right now in the U.S. Championship. As of this live recording, he has all draws. Shocking. I can't believe it. Okay. And maybe when the tournament's over, he'll have all draws, but I doubt it. Okay, so we have another, the move order from game one. This is Timo of Dominguez. Okay, in this game, black played h6 early, and they traded. And then white played the move queen f3, which I've never seen before. I played the queen's gambit with both sides my whole life. I've never seen this move. 
Okay, now this move has a crazy idea. And it's actually a crazy idea that I play a lot in blitz chess and bullet chess. In slow chess, I don't play it as much. The crazy idea is to castle queenside and play for an attack. Okay, well, obviously, white's queenside is developed, his kingside isn't, so castling queenside doesn't look too crazy. Okay, d takes c4. He wants to open up the position before white castles. Bishop takes c5. Taking on c4 and playing c5, typical idea in the queen's gambit declined, making sure that black tries not to get an isolated pawn, he gets rid of his d-pawn first. Now if white takes on c5, it seems impossible that white's going to castle queenside and black can win his pawn back later. So white played bishop b5 check, knight d7, knight e2, castles, and he castled queenside. Now the problem is, if you castle kingside with white, then queen f3 doesn't make a lot of sense. Black just has the two bishops, and black doesn't really have any problems. So he's trying to make the game interesting by castling queenside, and now we've seen opposite side castling game with an asymmetrical pawn structure with one side having the two bishops, that's good for playing for a win. So if you're black and you're playing for a win, which obviously Dominguez is playing for a win against a lower ranked player, this is exactly what you want. C takes d4, knight takes, queen b6, king b1, always play king b1. Black's play is very easy because black played c5 and took on d4. That's what black's goal in the queen's gambit declined is, is to get rid of those center pawns. White can't say I have a better center than you. White center is gone just like black center. But black does have the two bishops and black's attack against white's king looks a lot better than white's attack against black's king. I don't see white's attack against black's king, but I see a knight on c5, a queen on b6, a bishop on f6, a6 is coming, e5 and bishop e6. I see black attacking white. I don't see white attacking black yet. h4, making me eat my own words. Now he's attacking the black king. a6, bishop a4, rook to d8, bishop goes back to c2. Bishop d7, he just develops his pieces. Knight e4, and this is one of my favorite moves of the game. <clears throat> In this position, most people would be scared. And Dominguez says, I'm not scared of a mating attack. You don't have any pieces to mate me with. You traded all the pieces. So he just played the move bishop c6. <clears throat> he said, you want to play queen h7 check? Play queen h7 check. You can't play knight takes c6 because queen takes b2 is mate. So he did play queen h7, king f8, and he said, attack me with all your pieces. But there aren't any pieces to attack with. f3, never play f3. King e7, walking his king towards the center where it's safe. Queen goes back to d3. It wasn't doing anything on, on h7. King goes back to e8. Now the knight can't take with check because it's not check. And then I would play checkmate. Or I could take your queen. So king e8 is an excellent move. Stopping knight takes bishop check. Queen goes back to h7. Rook c8. Bishop e4. Bishop a4 attacking the rook on d1. Again, black's king is perfectly safe on the e7 and e8. And black's pieces are all attacking white now. Rook c1. They trade rooks. And now Dominguez must have read the chapter of the book I haven't written yet, which is to always sacrifice the exchange. And when you have the two bishops and opposite color bishops, your attack is even stronger. And obviously, Tim Ofeyev must have missed this move. One of the good things about taking with the rook is you keep your bishop here, and your bishop's defending g7, so your king side's all defended. Queen takes threatening, queen takes b2 mate. How do you stop queen takes b2 mate? Not easy. Not easy. Queen g8 check. Rook c7 check. And now we can stop queen b2 mate by playing rook c2, which we couldn't play before. Then he always repeats, always repeat. Then he takes the pawn, threatening queen takes b2 mate again. Then he goes back to, d, to b6. Now, queen b6 threatening mate, and more importantly, more importantly than threatening mate, he's stopping rook c7 check. So after rook c2, he plays the move, well, he actually repeats again. 
then he plays bishop a4. Earlier, when black played bishop a4, white played rook c7 check, and black played bishop to d7. Well, now you can't play rook c7 check, and you can't allow bishop takes rook. So you, you got to do something. <clears throat> he played rook to g2, saving his rook, and stopping queen g1 check. So for example, let's say you play rook d2, and you're like, maybe I'll mate him. Maybe he won't see queen d8 mate is coming. Well, then you get mated. White gets mated first. So he played rook g2, stopping queen g1, and Dominguez played the brilliant winning move, bishop takes b2. If you play rook takes b2, <coughs> queen g1 is mate. It's a funny mate, but it's still mate. After bishop takes b2, white's king has no defense to the queen and two bishops, so Timofey have resigned. But I like the way white's king was totally unsafe on the queen's side, as you can see, and black's king was perfectly safe on e7. Just nothing could attack it, can't open the center, no dark square bishop for white. So black got the two bishops, sacrificed the exchange, and his bishops and queen were too strong. Dominguez wins. Who would have thunk? The guy you heard of won. Amazing. Okay, last but not least... Topolov and Anand. Topolov and Anand actually have a lot of QGDs. This was played in China in 2010. And you can see they played a different move order. And somehow we get to a Queen's Gambit declined. And in this position, Anand played the Lasker variation, which he's played. You can also play the Tartakower variation with B6. When I was a kid, I always did what Karpov did, because Karpov seemed pretty good when I was a kid. He was the world champion. Um, and he played b6 here against Korshnoi. He played the Tartakower. Okay, but knight e4 is the Lasker variation. That's also quite common now. Trade, cd, knight c3, e takes d5. So white has a nice center, all those pawns in the center. Theoretically, white's bishop is better than black's bishop, because black has these pawns in the center on the white squares, and white's pawns are all on the dark squares. So his white square bishop is better. But black is very solid. So a lot of grandmasters think black has equalized here, because black doesn't have any weaknesses. Queen b3, threatening the pawn. Rook to d8. He plays rook to d8, because he might want to play c5 in one move. Doesn't want to play c6, and then play c5 later. He could play c5 in one move. So he plays rook d8, defending his pawn. C4, getting rid of the center pawn. Bishop E6, very sharp move. And I'm sure this is in their preparation because they played a world championship match and they're playing a lot of Queen's Gambits. So I'm sure they both looked at this position. C5 was played. Obviously, Queen takes uh, B7 is a very interesting move. I'm not sure what Anand would have done. Uh, his rook is hanging, so probably he plays something like Knight D7. And we have to decide whether, you know, this king is ever going to get safe on e1 or eventually black's going to play queen b4 check after something like rook, rook b8. So, for example, just off the top of my head, takes, rook b8, let's be greedy and take another pawn, queen b4 check. This looks very dangerous. This looks like white could get in trouble. Bishop takes d5. And white's king is just a sitting duck. White has two extra pawns, but black has all this initiative. So that's one variation, and I'm sure the players had this analyzed out since Anand has really deep prep. And Topolov played c5, gaining space on the queen side, b6, rook c1, and he played queen a3, pinning the pawn to the queen, knight d7, bishop b5. Topolov wants to take the knight and then take on c5 with the rook, <clears throat> bishop g4 trying to mess up Topolov's plans, takes, rook takes, queen takes c5. Now here, the move knight e5 looks interesting, but it looks like white can, black can play c takes d4, threatening the queen. Queen takes, rook takes. If you take with a pawn, your knight's pinned, and you lose your knight. If you take my bishop, your knight is trapped. I can play f5 or h5, and win, your, win my knight back, then black's going to be a pawn up in the end game. Maybe two pawns. 
So that was very tricky by Anand. So he played queen takes c5, trying to go into the end game, which looks good for white. Black has all these weak pawns. Anand says, no, thank you. Let's play a middle game where your king on e1 is no good. Rook g1. I don't know what to suggest for white. We can't move the knight because queen takes g2. We can't castle because bishop takes f3. So he played rook g1. Rook e8. And white just has a lot of problems with his king. He defends. Anon comes in through the b-file. Queen f5. Rook b1. Obviously, Topolov's king is no good. Rook b 8 is a nice move. If you take the queen, I play rook takes and win your rook. So he plays king e2, trying to run to f3. Queen f5, threatening the h-pawn. Rook h1, check. King runs to f3. h5, and material is equal, but Anand's king is just much safer than Topolov's, and Anand's rook is much better. Just looking at the rooks, you can see that black's winning. Black has a rook on the 7th, and white's rook is on h1, defending the h3-pawn. Terrible. The game didn't last much longer. h4 check. Get the king open. He took. If he plays the move king h2, that's even worse. Much worse. So he played king takes, rook f2, rook g2, and white resigned because should have resigned before. That's why he resigned now. So those were some Queen's Gambit games where white played differently, black equalized relatively quickly, and then the better player, not that Anand is better than Topolov, but Anand is better than Topolov. The better player outplays the opponent and then wins, and that's why a lot of grandmasters like to play the Queen's Gambit declined. They can get interesting positions, and they can outplay their opponent, and they can make fun of my D4, D4 course Starting out with d4, they're like, I'm going to play the queen's gambit declined, and I'm going to equalize and get an interesting position, and eventually I'll play you and win. They're not going to beat me because I retired. Okay, that'll show them. Just a second, I have to find something on my phone. And I found it. Okay. Um, so that's the queen's gambit declined. If you want to sponsor a lecture, like our good friend Alec Quinn, thanks for sponsoring this lecture, Contact Karen, Karen at ACLChessClub.com, and you can have a lecture on a player you like or an opening or on some crazy idea you have, as long as it's a crazy chess idea, and we'll get right back to you as soon as you pay us. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye.